first of all, a very good evening to you, sir. And um, we are very pleased to have you in this platform tonight. Uh, the ZNSP team is very much pleased to have you in this platform. And then um, I personally feel I am very much privileged to be able to interview someone of a great personality. Um, none other than the grandson of our great Naga freedom fighter, Sri Haipo Jagano. Um, my name is Kawi Zeng Dao Liu, and I will be your interviewer for tonight. Right now, I, I stay in Dimapur, Nagaland, and yes, I, I will be your interviewer for tonight. Thank you so much for making your, your, yourself available for this interview, sir. Thank you, thank you. Okay. I'm sure tonight the viewers and everybody is really excited and is eagerly waiting to know as to who is the grandson of Sri Haipal Jadanang. So first thing first, would you please introduce yourself to us first? Uh? <laughs> uh, very, very glad to meet you uh, through this platform. Uh, I'm very happy. The fact that, you know, the Zelengrung artist group had formed and, you know, bringing all this kind of people around to talk about our leader is in fact, uh, very grand way, I should say, though through the online platform. And to all my viewers, I, I think you had talked about my whatever, you know, background. I, I have no other than that to, you know, add on. But to tell you that uh, my name is, you, you know, that Pokindin Malang. My Pokindin means uh, like, uh, my grandfather, it's also, Pau means grandfather, Kin means some kind of relationship. In English, same as Kin, you know, that way. And Din means, in English also Din, you know, Din means noise. So kind of my grandfather's legacy, I need to bring some noises, some kind of that. So, uh, you know, same with uh, Liang, my brothers and me. So it was given to me this name by one of the uncle from my nat native place. So uh, my father gave birth to five siblings. I was the youngest, yeah, five siblings, uh, youngest one, I'm, I'm the youngest one, and born and brought up in None district. Are you hearing me? Yes, Are yes, you I, I can, yes, I can hear you. Since uh, it seems you doze off, so I was thinking, you know, <laughs> I'm not letting you hear, you know, whatever I'm saying. So I born and brought up in None hometown, uh, did my high school from Nune Town and my 10 plus 2 from Tamenglong headquarter. And then I went to Delhi for further studies, uh, Delhi University graduations. After that, I did my master from Dehradun, you know, and then came back to Delhi for MPhil program. And I'm also presently working for my thesis to complete. But uh, the uh, issue is that, you know, pandemic because of this COVID, I'm, I'm not able to finish. And side by side, I'm also working as a chairperson for Child Welfare Committee. So having said that, uh, you know, teaching was my passion earlier, but now I'm, I'm into government. So, uh, you know, little bit drawbacks was there because of engaging in government policies and programs. So there was that. I think more than enough of my... <laughs> of my, you know, of my profile, whatever you want to call it. All right, all right, yeah. sir. That was a wonderful introduction. And then you, in fact, are a very uh, qualified person. And yeah, we are really, we are really lucky, we should say, that you are from our own community. Okay, going to the next question. Hi, Pao Jadonang Malangme was born in the year 1905 to Thieu Dai, his father, and Tabon Liu, his mother, at Kambiron village. So regarding his family background, can you kindly elaborate to us? Uh, yes, uh, very good question, I should say. Uh, as you start with 1905, the birth year 1905, which, which is a very contentious, which means, uh, there is a problematic of the year defining the age, you know, 1905 means in 1931, he was just 26 years old. 
Hypozoidona was just 26 years old. So in human biology and to the contemporary whatever we see, years of 30, 30, we cannot decide. I'm sure Hypozoidona is far more intelligent than us, but with the human biology, I must say that 26 was least be, you know, too younger. That is why the family members, the elders in my family and my forefathers, they were saying that 1895 should be the year so that when he passed away in 1931, it becomes a 33 years, right? So th that was family, my family and elders had put up in the writing. But because uh, Professor Gamume had earlier written that 1905 was the bad year, because he he counted from Hyperanigatili with the thir 13 years back and then he drew that analysis. So there was a problem. Five should, you know, that in this, um, I think academic or whatever writing, we need to think back or discuss and analyze that, you know, whether 1905 was the right year or not. So number one. Number two, Chiudai was the father, that is correct. Number, uh, that is mother Tabonlu is not correct because uh, Chiudai had a two wife, okay. Sorry, my, my grandfather had two wives. <laughs> okay, so first was Chulung Liu. Chulung Liu was the mother of Haipo Zadwana. Haipo Zadwana has two siblings and including him only three. So two of them are elder to him. One is Mudunang, second is Nasulung Liu, third was Haipo Zadwana. And the second wife was Tabonlu, okay? Tabonlu had two siblings. One was Tiningam, second was uh, Jalimlu. So uh, no doubt that, you know, Tabonlu is the stepmother of Haipo Zadwana, okay? But unfortunately, the, the first mother, Haipo Zadwana, real mother expired very soon. So the stepmother took him up. And there, there was a story, a lot of story, you know, between the stepmother and the uh, uh, hypozoidona. That is why the story of, you know, uh, you know, running around and all those stories are there, but, but I cannot elaborate now. So that, that was it. And the family background that uh, I want to tell you that his grandfather was a very, uh, not a great, but somehow he was very politically, you know, in his contemporary, he was very popular. So I think um, most, most of his grandfather were very particular about uh, the activities that he was going on in the society. And then he was a little bit known because th there was a conflict, you know, village feud. We call it, uh, you know, Sangnari in, in Rome dialect that two villages used to fight. And then that Haipo Zodonang grandfather, Maithangui, used to solve that kind of problem. So he was, in fact, a you know, peace negotiator kind of thing. So, and then I think that is why Haipo Zadwanang became a political, you know, politically oriented because his grandfather was earlier had the kind of uh, idea. So in his family, this must be the talk or discussion has been going on. I think that is how he, you know, innate, I think within the family itself had discussed all about politics. That is why he, uh, kind of draw, draw the ideas of this contemporary uh, problem. I think uh, that will end the uh, introduction of the family background. Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, thank you so much for making the clarification regarding his mother, Tabon Liu, because we got all the source from internet. And then, in fact, we, we should not believe everything and anything that we get in internet. <laughs> thank you so much for the clarification. <clears throat> okay, going to the next question. Um, uh, he established the Haraka movement uh, yes. based on the ancestral Naga religion. So, yeah, can you also elaborate a little bit on this? Yeah, the, to your questions, uh, yes, the Haraka movement, the word Haraka is pure. I was told that. So, pure generic but pure because 
there was taboos, lot of taboos and lot of zenas observing by the people. And they faced lot of struggles, you know, following all those practices. There are more than 20s, 30s, zenas and taboos that uh, on the death of a person, you cannot go out. If the child is born to the family, you cannot uh, go out or somebody cannot enter the village. Mm -hmm. There are n numbers of taboos and genus, which forbids people from working. So when we talk about the livelihood, it was affecting badly. And as well as it's talk about security, it was affecting badly. That's why Haipo Zadwanang see that kind of situations and he perceived that something must be changed. Although he do not change everything, but out of 20s taboos and genas, he restricted to only nine. That is why uh, that was the natural outcome, okay? That was the natural outcome from the irrational practice of social systems earlier. So he tried to adopt new hymns, new prayers, new song, because uh, they cannot accommodate. Earlier the, earlier the Naga's traditional religion was uh, very strict. You cannot put a new song or whatever, new ideas into it. So the oral tradition, tradition comes very long and they cannot recreate it. So thereby, Hypo Zedwanang came and abolished that, that kind of thing and create new sense of this tradition. That is why Heraka means new, unique, you know, very generic also. Uh, that is how it came. So it's a natural outcome from the fact that people could not practice because of the rigidity of the tabus and zenna. I think that is more than enough. All right, all right, yeah. Uh, okay, moving on to the next question. Uh, the Haraka movement also did face opposition from the Christian converts as well as other uh, Naga communities and people who practice um, uh, traditional religion. But besides yes. his religious aspects, Jadunang's movement also had a political aim. So can you tell us more about his movement of <coughs> political aim? Yes, uh, there, there was, <clears throat> earlier the converts to Christianity had some issue because the popularity of the uh, Herakop movement, what we call, what we understood now, has more members present. You know, it's a kind of revival going on. On the other hand, the Christianity also coming in a big wave. That is why there was a contradictory or there was a contention between these two religions coming and, you know, facing each other. Now, it, in order to understand this, I think one particular man, his name was Jin Lapo Gangmai. He was the first convert and then fortunately or unfortunately, he was the Mohori, that means uh, Lambus kind of thing. So employed by the Britishers in order to see the functioning of the government of the Britishers. So he uses his Christianity as well as his his designation as a Mahuri, taking this advantage and, you know, subjugate, you know, try to forcefully, you know, uh, what do I say, force the Heraka movement to, you know, not grow kind of thing. So idea was there. So totally against it. In fact, the political aim, whether he mentioned it or not, whether Hypo Zadwanang mentioned it or not, but he, his aim was about his self-administration. So everything what he does was, his, there must be a person who belongs from this land and rule the land. You know, that the Britishers should not rule, the Maitai should not rule, the Kuki should not rule, the Ahomia, the Assam, Asmis should not rule. So how, therefore, the Nagas or the Makam, the Zelengrong should rule our own people. That kind of significant political aim was there. So he has seen many administrations uh, such as the Maite Kings and all. So he was talking about uh, that there must be self-rule, you know, self-administration kind of thing, okay? 
So I think that was his political aim. Okay, okay. thank you so much. Uh, yes. We also learned that he used to pray for long hours and visit places like Bhuvan Cave and Zaylaj Lake um, and make predictions and heal the sick people using herbs, etc. So, uh, so uh, uh, can you also tell us about his spiritual life? The Bubon Cave and Jailat Lake is very scenic, you know, a very, a very nice place, as you say. I think Bubon Cave is one of the biggest cave in, uh, you know, uh, entire Northeast. So it's a beautiful place. And Jailat Lake also one of the, uh, you know, in our Jalangrong, you know, topographical area, I think that is a very scenic. So uh, taking on this uh, kind of thing, you know, the, the picture, the beauty of all that, he went to this particular two places, particular, okay. In, in what we have observed in whatever writings and what we have discussed, you know, is more likely to draw that his visit was more of, you know, meditations, I should say, because he tries whatever he observe, you know, that Maitai has king, Britishers came in such manner that they can conquer it. And, you know, in the Silcha areas, the Bengali had their own kind of setting, the communities, whatever is happening. So he wants to change that. So through self meditations, you know, uh, on the other hand, some people will say that he was talking with a God. Okay, uh, he might be talking with a God and he might be praying. But what I have observed from my personal view is that it is more of meditations, either being, uh, either being talking or praying with a God or talking with the you know discussions going on that you know what must he do and what can he do, but more of you know reflecting other communities, what other communities are doing and what kind of functions they are doing and perceiving himself that, you know, he can change that kind of things wing on at a two particular place. So uh, that kind of, uh, you know, thought process was developed there because in, in most of the time, he, he hardly has a time for, uh, you know, self-reflection, you know. So in these two particular place, he went there, he visits, he must be talking, but he himself devote and meditate so that whatever he wants to practice, he think of the policy and program, what he will do that coming from uh, coming back from that area and then what he can do. So I think more of the meditations rather than, you know, praying and chanting of that. So uh, that's my opinion. I mean, uh, some of us can deflect that point. I hope so. That's that's answer to you. All right, all right. In uh, one of his famous slogan, it says uh, "Nagaraj" or "Makam Gwangde." So, what does this particular words mean? And then, why was the British regime against that particular slogan? Yes, um, this particular slogan has been you know, very political. Not even Nagas of wherever Nagas had ever talked about this kind of thing because this is politically designed, you know, slogan. Makam Gwangdu Tupuni, Makam Gwangdi. Some of the, uh, the academicians also um, Criticized that uh, you know makam is not related only selling wrong, but it's a conglomerations or whatever nagas as a whole. So it's it connotes differently according to the different person. So the person who perceives different may also see that makam gondi is different in the perspective. But um, <clears throat> Zadonang do not see that you know nagas that the different tribes. He don't see the difference, rather. So he wants to bring together his experience with the village to village, you know, problem. So he wants to bring together. He was not demarcated by the fact of the state for Nagaland Nagas or Manipur Nagas. He didn't have that kind of knowledge. He was accommodating because 
he was that kind of person. I think uh, on the latter part of our discussion, we, we would go to that. So <clears throat> that was his slogan. Uh, so accommodating all the tribals, you know, especially in the Nagas. So uh, it was there. So now the slogan has affect the Britishers because they were, they were the conquering empires. They were challenged. They thought that no one enters their empire. You know, they are conquering ideas was there. So we need to colonize more people. But there was a person who by the very fact of no literature, no knowledge of what is uh, meaning military, what is army, what whatsoever, what is education. But coming from very remote area and try to challenge that I am the ruler, you need to pay taxes to me. You cannot ask us to carry your luggages. I am the king over here. So that was the moment uh, this slogan was affecting directly challenge the authority of the Britishers. I think uh, that is more than enough, I think, to tell about his slogans and why irritating was the Britishers about this slogan. Thank you. Uh, we also learned that Hai Pao Jadunang made several attempts to meet Mahatma Gandhi with his followers, uh, uh, including 200 boys, Naga boys and girls. So can you narrate the whole thing as to what must be his intention behind the, yeah, the, the attempt to meet Mahatma Gandhi? Yes, according to the literature available and the forefathers, you know, the elders uh, were discussing about this, 100 boys and 100 girls, exactly it happens. There was a dance practice. There was a song composed. Song was composed already. That was the year 1927. He had aware of the fact that Gandhiji led the Indian National Congress and fight against the British for India's freedom struggle that he was aware of. And then he drew the understanding that if such person has the kind of knowledge, so I must contact him in order to gain or in, in order to build relationship and understand that the British was the common enemy. But some scholars was uh, you know, not able to understand that. For example, the song, the song that composed was running like this: "Apo Gandhi Puno, He Guang Lam Khang, He Pati Khaizo, He Pati Khaizo." In literal meaning, it was, "Oh Lord Gandhi, become our king, come forth, come forth." So, Hypo Zadwanang never talks about become our king. But in our Jalang community, we used to praise, you know, our guests as high as the God, right? We used exactly. to praise him that he is not equal. He is the best. He is the hero of all time. We used to praise that. Now, what he meant to say was, he's just praising about Gandhi, but he never calls upon Gandhi to be to rule over the Nagas, whereas we are against the British. We cannot ask Gandhi to come and rule over us. I, so uh, uh, that was happening and it didn't happen because there was problem of uh, Satyagraha movement, civil disobedience movement. So the, uh, Gandhi could not come to Siuchar and that's why the program was all off. I think that's uh, the end. Time yes, is running yes. out. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we also learned that he organized Haraka army um, and challenged the mighty British army. So based on this, can you tell us about how many armies were recruited by him? Or uh, yeah, just, just more about his army. Okay, uh, I, I will say uh, five points, okay, directly. He called it Rifian, okay? Uh, you know, a dialect Rifian, more of like a, not a military, but a kind of volunteers kind of thing. Uh, that is why uh, in those days they call it Rifian until now we are calling it Rifian. Now, in order to draw that kind of, I, I was told that as big as 500, you know, volunteers were called upon and were given training. So how, how this number of 500 came? I was told that 
the villages used to big villages will send 20 or 30 right so uh, surrounding villages send their volunteers to, to become a part of the uh, military army as, and so you know our word so uh, quota was sent there and the training was imparted through through the drill based on his uh, you know development he didn't take uh, the drills from other, but he invented himself the drill. So they were trained in a drill. Armed with them, there was, um, according to the, you know, record, um, Manipur administrative record, there was 85 guns, you know, 22 were surrendered, something like that. So the guns were also procured in order to fight against uh, the British. So rationing them, giving them food, and there was divisions of male and female was there. So uh, equipped, with modern, modern, not high tech, but at the contemporary, it was modern enough to be called as an uh, army to fight against. Uh, All right. On February 19, 1931, Higgins, with the help of Mills and Gimson, the then um, Deputy Commissioner of Kachar arrested Jarama on the charge of raising Nagaraj and for his resistance against the British government. Uh, so based on this, can you tell us the full story of his death or what led to his death? Hmm. It's a bit uh, lengthy story, uh, to, uh, lengthy questions, you know, and the, the answer that needs to be clarified. Uh, in the 1931, in the month of February, he went. He went to Bubon Kef. Before that, the Gangai was happening somewhere around December 25th till January 1st week. So on that very, very day, there was a jaina that no one should enter the village. So unfortunately, four Manipuri bitter leaf traders came to uh, Kuilong, Kambiron village. And they were hinted not to enter to the village. So they obeyed and then stay back in the, in the gate of the village. But whereas they were not supposed to fire, lit up the fire. So unfortunately, that four traders lit up the fire. And uh, volunteers, as the Donam volunteers was presently right there. So unfortunately, they were killed with the fact that, that you should not lead a fire. Today is not to lead the fire and not to enter. So that was, that was happening. So in that, they were killed. No one knows. Secretly killed and they were buried somewhere. No one knows. But the Manipuri people from uh, Imphal Valley started putting an uh, you know, FIR and searching start wing on that. How these four men were, you know, where were they? You know, that thing was happening in the government, in, in the police office. But uh, Zadonang, since he was not there the moment where this incident happened, he didn't have the knowledge. So he went to, uh, in the month of February, somewhere that uh, 12, 13, 14 is the right time to visit Bhubon. So he went there in the 12th, 13th of the February, 1931. And then he visited Bhubon Cave. On the very day, Bhubon Cave, when he visits Bhubon, the guard Bhubon told him, foretold him that some bad thing is going to happen to him. That is why he came dejected, okay? That you cannot run away, but you will fall trap in that. So, so the story of his death was foretold there. When he returned from Bhuvan cave and stayed at Binakhandi, he was captured. He could have run away, but he was not that kind of person who sneak away, right? He was a person with a charismatic leader, face to face, he wants to silence directly, not looping around or not running around the booths. So he faced that with sincere heart that I didn't do it. And then he was captured. And then from there, uh, the Assam rifle took him to the Imphal and he reached Imphal on 29 March, 1931. So 29, March 1931 was the date when he was put to jail in Imphal jail. From that on, the tussle was going on, that the questioning was going on, that there were 24 
you know, 24 uh, people were selected, you know, uh, because there was uh, more than that kind of uh, people were there, more than 30 or 50 people were there, but uh, some of the that Jin Lakpo didn't know that. So, unfortunately, <clears throat> uh, his petitions was dragging on that he says that he was innocent, but, uh, you know, the people coming from uh, villages were, uh, you know, took part, who took part in this, uh, you know, killing or murdering of those people say that Zadonang was the one because there was a uh, you know, conspiracy going on. So Zadonang, he, he himself said that, no, I wasn't there. I was at Nunka where Rani Gaidilu's, you know, birthplace. He was working on the new house, you know, painting a new house. I wasn't there, but uh, there was a conspiracy theory going on there. So <clears throat> the other who were captured by the Britishers ask them, influence them that, that by saying that if you do not say that Zadwanang started this killing or ordered that killing, you all will be executed. So the fear of that also happening. So all, all of them who were captured by the Britishers told that, you know, promised that Zadwanang killed according to his order, we kill them. That was how it happens. Now, he also pleaded to uh, governing council, government council for mercy petitions. But unfortunately, his petitions was rejected by virtue of the fact that <clears throat> the petitioner was not a lawyer, but a petition writer. So that, that was the problem. And he didn't get, uh, you know, mercy, you know, reprieve of his uh, death sentence. Uh, that is how he was hung. On the day he was hung, uh, less people were there, you know, very few people were there, uh, especially from his, uh, you know, contemporary, but, uh, you know, the Infal Belly, some women folk was there, some witness was there, so uh, not many of his, uh, you know, um, volunteers or whatever, his disciples uh, could not come because the fear of the Britishers was already there. Okay, so, um, in addition to your answer, uh, Haipo Jadunang was, um, was arrested for two reasons. Number one is for raising a Naga Raj and then his resistance against the British government. And then the second one is on the false allegation that, uh, uh, that under his command, the four Christian Manipuri Betelif traders were murdered. Yeah. Is it? Right, sir? Uh, initially, what was going on was that the bitter leaf traders murder was the first thing happened. But Britishers pretty well knew that if we don't take this opportunity and try to you know, subjugate or try to kill him, you know, the word is very strong, but try to capture him or do something. If not, the Nagaras or Makam Gongdi will affect the British expanding ideas, colonist idea. That is why they intentionally try to bring that political agenda because they knew that he was not the murderers. They knew very well that he was not there at the time of that incident happens. But why this death sentence was carried out? Because his Nagaras was very particular, very resounding, and it's affecting their designs of capturing these people. So uh, that was the reason. So that political was you know, inventing inside of that. Uh, he, they knew pretty well that, you know, the murders didn't happen by his order. Rather, they knew that it was Rani Gaitilu who was ordered to murder that people. So that was that. So politically, he was cut short of his life, not because of the traders. Yes. All right, all right. 
Okay, moving on to the next question. Uh, according to you, uh, what do you think? As in, who was Hypo Jarunang to other Naga communities? And yeah, especially to our Zilyangrong community and also uh, the Meites and the Cookies. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I will start with the Meites. Meites mostly have a belief that you know, a shaman, a kind of a person, a healer, traditional healer, a person which has the knowledge of witchcraft, those kind of things, shaman, we call it right in English. So that was, and they pretty knew that he also was a healer because he was using a traditional uh, medicines practices. And then they healed, you know, because of his knowledge in this tremendous herbal, medicines. So that was the fact. And also they were thinking that, you know, since that Maitai has a king, so as Nagas, this Zalangro had a king, they kind of uh, had that knowledge, but they don't perceive that these Nagaras or Hypo Zudwanan would not affect the kingdom because they the Jalangrong land is uh, very hilly and rigid, so mountainous region. So they, they, they were not, you know, thinking of, you know, bad things about the Jalangrong in fact. So they were thinking that, you know, just a king, a small king maybe, and then having the knowledge of traditional medicines and he was a healer and he was, a, a, you know, practicing of Saman. That kind of knowledge was there. Because through all the reading, there was no confrontations between Maitai and the uh, the Hypo Zedwanang volunteers. Just that because of the, these uh, bitter leaf uh, traders, there, there was no problem earlier and even after that. So for Maitai, it was clear. For Cookie, we know the fact that, you know, since the revolt uh, of Cookie rebellion, rebellion starting from 1917 to 1919, where mostly Jalangro areas was force or rather you know rather been killed by the militants of this uh, cookie so there was a foretold that one day definitely the zelangrong people especially will you know revenge uh, you know try to return whatever they had done so they see that hypo zadwanang seems the probable you know that he could be the person who tries to retaliate whatever they had done to the land of the Zelengro. So it was directly enemy or antagonist kind of thing. Uh, thirdly, for Longdimai, for our Zelengro Pui, uh, what we call now and what we understood, that it was thing that since there was a proclamation, there was a foretold that there would be Messiah, there will be the person who delivers justice, you know, who, who will give us the freedom, you know, that kind of uh, foretold was there. So one thing is deliberate. Hypo Zanonang was deliberate from all this because that was the moment only when we were awakened. So enlightenment was there. So we can say that he was the deliberate and then he was the proclaimer. He was the person who proclaimed that Jalangrong or the Makam Guang, we will have an independent country. So he was a proclaimer. He was, a, uh, again, he was a pathfinder. Pathfinder means where he tries to find ways in order to bring unity and political solutions. And he, he equipped with military might, military powers, military force in order to draw that kind of legitimacy to the political design. So uh, for Long Dimai, till now, he is a proclaimer and he is a, you know, part finder for us till now, I, I should say that. Because we, we see inspiration from his life. Though a very short life, but we see, uh, you know, very fearful, he, he never fears of anything, but he was very bold and brave. And he do what he wants, he really wanted to do. So, he is a part finder, a deliberator, and proclaimer. 
for a long time, I should say. Some, <laughs> some, yeah. Some says that uh, Hypo Jadunang is a mystic leader. So, uh, can you tell us as to whether Hypo Jadunang was really a mystical leader or realistic in his approach uh, to fulfill his dream of Makam Gwangde? Yeah, this question had been uh, a lot of these discussions happen around. Uh, fortunately, <clears throat> our Professor Gamuma used this word a mystic rebels. In fact, he was not a mystic. He was a person, he was an individual having all kind of personality, same as you and me. But he has a charismatic leadership qualities in him that he, he is not a cheater, you know? He was bold, brave, courageous, and he can never be a mystic. Now, the word mystic is mis misleading to us. Or rather, if we see that mystic, that means we can see the religious connotations. When you exemplify a person, the person in the domain of religion, then you mystify that one. And then uh, we call it in, in Christianity, we call it as a Saint Peter, Saint Matthew, right? Yes. So the word mystic, yes. Uh, the, the mystic is an ordination or connotation of religious affiliations rather than his approach of political whatever uh, individuality. So they try to bring that Zadwanang is more of a religious you know, uh, person than of his political. But what we see now is though he might be a very spiritual person, but we see more of his political approach was rightful. Political approach was very, uh, you know, uh, categorized as very powerful, you know, thing. Whatever he does was right. Whatever he, he think was, you know, appropriate of the time. No, he never is, uh, be a mystic. So uh, that the word mystic has been a lot of criticisms, though uh, some of us tries to say that mystic was the, you know, uh, was the right word to say that. But for me, in my understanding, I rather would say that, that he was a very realist person, having all those personality, charismatic and, uh, you know, he was, he was a very, you know, charismatic, you know, very bold, brave. How can he become a very, you know, mystical, you know, that he lost into religion where uh, he, with all this power of magic, he never does that. Though he, he might be doing at his personal level, but through all the schemes of development, you know, tries to bring the political, you know, togetherness. I, I mystic, you know, personality in there. I think that answers your questions. Is, is that good I, enough? Yes, yes. No, I, I'm very glad that we're having this interview because uh, we get to clarify um, on, on certain things. Yeah. 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 Um, what, according to you, uh, what circumstances, according to you, influenced Haipo Jarunang to develop and shape his social, religious, and political movement? Uh, <clears throat> In the discussion that is going on in my family and with my elders, there was no specific point that he started this, uh, you know, political movement, whatever socio, you know, socio-cultural change that happened. But we can observe <clears throat> from the point where, starting from, <coughs> I'm sorry, <clears throat> starting from his childhood, and when he was becoming a teenage, he visited Chilchar. The moment he visited Chilchar, he, he observed what is going on in the city of Chilchar, how people are living, what kind of re residence, the temple, the religion, 
you know, the political life, the religious life, military or police force are doing it, right? So the moment when he visits Chilchar, when he was entering into the teenage age, for the purpose of taking a uh, salt and some uh, dao for clearing of the jungles, he, he used to visit Chilchar. So he draws some kind of idea that, that we need to change. Because when you go back, when you return back to his hometown, home village, I rather, he see that needs to be changed. So there was no point in time where suddenly change that happens, but it came directly from his visit to the future. Okay, moving on to the next question we have. Um... Haipo Jarunang had a political ideology that uh, the son of the soil must rule. So based on this, uh, what do you think or in what way can the young generation of our people learn and draw inspiration from his ideology? Um, son of the soil must rule. The contemporary, this today's world would not accept that. But when we recount or when we introspect, whatever, what kind of social systems were present there at the contemporary Hypozodona would tell so. Because at the time, there was forceful occupations by the Britishers. There were forced labor we were forced to pay taxes. So having a person from his own community as a king or as an administrator or as a ruler would benefit more than the, than the rest that coming from outside. So this was, this was okay at a time, this was accepted at a, at a time because the condition was just that outsiders were ruling us, over us. There were forced labor happening. What kind of activities we do, we need to, we need to go through all the scrutiny. But now, when we see these situations, that son of the soil must rule. Although we want our Zelengrong youth or Zelengrong leaders to rule over us, but uh, you know, in, in the academic, we would not really accept it because the person who ha has more, uh, you know, personality, you know, the person who has more knowledge must rule. So the 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 questions of now and then was is differed according to time and space. But of course. When Haipo Zedonang started his movement, this political ideology of the sun must rule. So it was rightly observed and it was okay to accept that. But uh, at the moment, by now, I think uh, there has more, you know, we, we want to open up because we, 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 don't, we don't want to be so close, you know, we want some person who is, who is more expertise or who has more knowledge can come and can rule over, rule over us so that we can mo draw more, you know, sources or ideas rather than, you know, our own community. So uh, I think this is just my opinion, okay? This is my just opinion. Um, I think I'll end here. All right. All right. Uh Hi, Paul Jadunang. We learned that uh, he also wrote so many songs and uh, yeah, he composed so many songs. So in one of his famous songs that says, Tanroi Magna Tubam Nye Rale Tilo Zayo. How do we reconcile the thought of Hi, Paul in this phrase that was coined metaphorically? And because this line has been criticized by some of our people. So can you share your personal opinion on this? Mm, uh, again, this question is similar to the previous one where we talk about the son of the soil must rule. So now, <clears throat> that means in literal mean, meaning, without work, you know, 
we want to eat and we want to survive, you know, without working it. So, and then please grant us that kind of enjoyment, that kind of joy, that kind of freedom. So that this word or this sentence is again the misleading if we translate literally. But when, when we see his political ideology starting from his uh, teenage till he die, till his death, we see that there is possibility of enjoying, enjoy in terms of administrations, in terms of enterprise, in terms of business. You know, there are resources where we can enjoy. So that is why he talks about political ideology where Makam Gondi or Nagaras. So we have to rule over, rule over among us, not by the others. That is why he said, Tanroi Magna means when he visit Shilcha, he often visit Shilcha. So he draw ideas from that, that without sweat and without hard work, we can also enjoy. He sees clearly that Britishers are enjoying their life with just by gunpowder. They don't do hard work. If they want to transport anything, they were hired. They were hired and they were forced labor. So there is no hard work in them. He also sees that in, while, while he was visiting Shilcha, how what kind of business was going on? There was no hard labor. He sees that kind of idea and he must have perceived that kind of enjoy, that kind of freedom that he longed for. That is why he was asking to the God or he was praying to the God that with this song, we can ask our God, which he, which he was praying that, you know, that give us, grant us this kind of enjoyment or the life so that without hard work, we can live peacefully in this Jalengrung. I would end here. Is that, uh, is that good enough to answer? Yes, yes. I'm sure uh, the since yeah, I, I don't know, but I find the lines very beautiful. I'm sure the song must also be very beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it right that the Naga political groups are trying to appropriate Jadunang, claiming that he fought against the British for Naga Raj or Makam Gwangde? What do you have a say in this? <laughs> Appropriations of Hypo Zadunang. His tactics, his approach, his political ideology. Though many of our known underground, they try to appropriate, including NSNIM and ZUF. The two factions of the ZUF also tries to appropriate. And a lot of discussions going on that he was a person who, who fought against the Britishes. And I suppose Adonan never let others to rule. So there was a appropriations was going on. But the difference is very clear. Now, when we see Hypo Zadwanang live, we hardly see violence. Have we seen violence in his life? No, we don't see violence. Although he equipped himself with arms and ammunition that in future he will fought against. But he was more of social change. He tries to bring social change and political ideology, not that directly confronting with the arm. That is the difference between the appropriations of the underground group till now and then hypos adwana. Because we, we never seen or we never heard that he will kill somebody or he, he never challenged the Britishers that we will shoot you, we will abuse you or anything like that. But he was saying that I am the king, I'm the ruler, you must stay, pay taxes to me that you should not say. I have my only treasure, I have my song, I have my volunteers. 
you know, such kind of knowledge was there. So uh, this is my opinion. To, you know, someone can rightly, you know, criticize me or object me. But I, I've never seen that hypothesis was so violent. So whatever we have seen now, either NSN IM or ZUF, they will ask me uh, after this, uh, you know, interview or not, <laughs> I'm not sure, but let them, but I will, I will definitely tell them that Zadunang <laughs> never use that kind of force word. I would kill you or I will, you know, you know, something like that. He never used that, but he was using political, politically oriented word or sentences where he used the son of the soil must rule. So that was very political. Nagaras, Makam, Gwangdi, you know, that kind of thing was there. He never, in all this literature, he never mentioned, and people never mentioned he hold up a gun or dao, and he never ever, you know, shoot a gun, but he was trained them. So a big thing going on, right. But uh, I would yes. say that the appropriations that is happening and uh, the approach of Hypozadonam was two different aspects to, to study till now. I think that's all my opinion. All right, all right. Um, we are almost coming to the end of our session. Uh, a few more questions left. Uh, could you please share a little more on the vision of Haipo Jadunang and its relevance in the contemporary Ziliangrong society? A very nice question that everyone must ask these questions and we must, we must answer ourselves. We cannot ask our leaders to answer these questions. Rather, we must ask ourselves as an individual, what kind of vision that Hypo Zadonang has for the Zelenron? For me, I had two points. One is his political ideology. His political ideology was not mixing up by corruptions, not consumed by money factors. And he never won a very luxurious life. Though according to his positions, he might have the luxury, but he never accumulates that kind of wealth. Even if we discuss, even if we visit the place, place where he live or his contemporary, he never had that kind of you know, wealth he accumulate. So his political ideology was to draw inspirations that we must rule our, ourselves, that we, we are the ones whom we should rule, not by the others. So there is a kind of incarnate in our individual that we must reveal to ourselves that we are the ones, not, we cannot depend on other. So his political ideology of togetherness, and in his life, he never used wrong mai, jay mai, liang mai, even naga tribe, other naga tribe. He never differs that. And he, he never used his partiality. We never heard of any kind of partiality when he delivers healing. When the interview was going on, whosoever visits him, there were the people who are downtrodden, especially the illness, the sickness, who seek his guidance, who seek his healing, were the ones who were downtrodden. So he never, you know, dissecting between these people and that person. There was no such kind of ideas with, was, was there. So I think we can draw that Hypo Zedwanang was a very real person where there is no discrimination among us. We should come together. We have to fight together. We have to train ourselves. That is, uh, that is political ideology, number one. Number two, I want to say is that social change. He don't want 
to stick on to the olden traditions. But he was of the opinion that if we try to bring some changes that accommodates his con contemporary, some change will, will be there. So he tries to bring social change. For example, the tabus and jenas, where the olden traditions used to, used to practice. He tries to bring changes in that so that everyone can enjoy life. And he, he, he composed new song so that in his contemporary, we can accommodate new ideas into that. The dance was you know, composed again. So all those we see in his life was about social change, not radical. He never discriminate that, you know, the olden was bad and new thing was good, but he tries to bring, and he never punish the person who was following the olden traditions. Never in the, never in the uh, discussion or never in, in the record had ever told about that. But he also tries to bring literature as the foundations of communicating with others. So he brought a script, you know, alphabet. But uh, unfortunately, uh, his script was not able to, you know, underst understand by us by now, but we have another one uh, presently working on it. I think, I think that will be our script now. So when we see his life, he brings two things, political ideology, and the second was social change. I think these two points is very significant uh, that you know, it can allow us to understand as to why we fail, you know, uh, fail us so miserably that we, we are so divided. In his political ideology, there was no we may, liang may, zay may. But there was oneness in his political ideology. And the second point was social change. He tries to bring changes in the society. He was not radical, but he was realist. Uh, I think that, that was uh, my point. I hope so. I, you know, bringing up these two points and answer your questions. Very uh, beautiful answer indeed. Yeah. I, how I wish um, if our people could also grab the ideology of Haipal Jaranang of uh, oneness, the, the, the feeling of integrity, the sense of yes. brotherhood. Yeah. Yes. Uh, going to the next question, I find this question very interesting because I'm sure that the, the viewers tonight, they must also be as curious as me to know the personal life of Haipal Jadunang. Uh, so can you tell us uh, as to who was the wife of Haipal Jadunang and how many children he had? Yeah, something about his personal life. Yeah. Uh, Jadunang had three wives. Are you hearing me, Dao Dao? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, uh, our legendary heroes had three wives, similar to the Solomon of the Bible. The first wife was Chulung Liu Dang Wei. Chulung Liu was the first wife. She was married according to the customary. So, she gave birth to Kaguidamang. Kaguidamang dies before he entered adolescence. That means be before he entered five years. So I was told that Kaguidamang died somewhere two to three years. So he never entered adolescence. The second wife was Maza Nangliu. This first and second wife was the daughters of Kasamtai, okay. There were two sisters. So Lung Liu was the elder one, Maza Dang Nang Liu was the younger one. So two sisters from same father married with the same guy. So Maza Nang Liu was 
again married to Hypozodonang as a second wife. She gave birth to Disrempo Malangmai. That is my father. Mazadang Nangliu was not married according to the customary because the first wife was according to the customary of the Romai traditions, Heraka, whatever religion they had. So they cannot have two sisters coming together and having the second wife in uh, solemnized in the same tradition. So Mazad Nangliu, though he married with that, but he could not conduct as a tradition, trad according to the traditions. So they had a son, the third, the third one was uh, he married again before, just before he his uh, captured. Okay, that means in in the year around 1930s, somewhere October or November, he married his the third wife. Um, this Holland, I need to see that. This, uh, all right, all right. This just was you. Thing. Yeah. Yes. The third wife name was Kuzim Liu Gangmai. Okay. Uh, she was from Gangmai family, Gangmai clan. Kuzim Liu was the third wife, and she didn't give birth to any of them. So they don't have a, a son or daughter because uh, the moment she was married, he is already uh, you know into the jail. He was uh, running for his life. So uh, there was no sons or daughter. So yeah, uh, Hypozodona had three wives. Now, after 29 August 1931, the first wife, Sulung Liu, remarries again. She was from Dangmai family in, and she married to Dangmai person again. And they had a son, uh, they had a son, <clears throat> Dam Kui Pao, okay? Dam Kui Pao was uh, the son when uh, Sulung Liu remarries again after the death of Haiko Zedwana. And uh, her husband name was Hoi Kung Ngam Dagmai. And the second wife, Mazad, Mazad Nang Liu, that is my grandmother, she never remarries. Even after Haipo Zedwanang death, she did not marry anyone, but she live there and take care of our father, that was the second, uh, the third wife, Kuzim Liu, marries again and they have a sons and daughter now. Uh, th th that is uh, th the story of how Hypozodona had three wives and why uh, the only son, this is uh, you know, alive today and I'm, I'm the grandson. I think I'll end here. Is that okay? Yes, yes. I, I'm very glad that we're having this uh, interview because as far as my knowledge is concerned, um, uh, the record about his personal life was nowhere to be found. That's why I, I'm glad that you, you you spoke about this. Initially, I thought that you will not be very comfortable about this question, but I'm glad that you opened no, that no, up. No. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Okay, we are coming to almost the last question. Uh, how old were you when Haipo Jadonang was sentenced to death? Or do you have any memories about Haipo Jadonang? Uh, uh, before I was born, uh, he was uh, hung to death. Uh, in fact, my, when my father was just four and a half years, he was dead. Okay. okay. So uh, just my grandmother, grandmother. Even then, I, I didn't see see her when she was alive. Uh, I have three sibling knew very well about my grandmother. They have lived together for a good year of sixties, I think. 
So uh, when my father converted to Christianity somewhere in 1974, mm -hmm. uh, later on I, I was given birth. So um, I didn't have that kind of, uh, you know, the bearing of what happens to my grandfather. But I was told by my father and my mother later on. So uh, that was that. Okay, okay. Uh I don't know. I'm so full of uh, curiosity. Uh, awesome. uh, we got, yeah, we got this source from the internet that um, Rani Gaidinliu is the cousin sister of Hypo Jadanang. Yeah, so if you can say something on that, I mean, how far is it true? Or, yeah, because we cannot just believe anything and everything that we see in internet. So since you are from a genuine source, I would like to hear from you. <laughs> uh, every every Pamik clans will say, you know, whoever belongs from uh, Pame, Pame in Zema, yes, will say that they are cousins. In fact, under the clan of Pame, there are sub clans. So, I am Malangme. My grandfather. Father was Malangmai, Rani Gadi Liu was Pame. She was from Longkau village, which is very far, far from each other. So, uh, so under the head of Pame clan, we can call as a brother or sister or cousin. But definitely, we are not related, blood <coughs> related. In fact, if things were to be understood, Haipai Rani Gadilu was given as, as uh, you know, foster. Uh, I'm not uh, wanting to demoralize or whatever, but more of foster child to Haipo Zadwana. By virtue of his healing power, the fact that Rani Gadiliu earlier had some illness. Okay. So okay. upon his curing, upon her curing of her illness, she was uh, more of given her, you know, what do you say, uh, I foster kind of thing to hypo Zedonang. So uh, that is that is why she didn't return to Longkau when uh, before hypo Zedonang uh, death. Because in the understanding of the family between this um, Rani Gatiliu family and Zedonang family, that she should be a foster daughter that kind of understanding was there so we are uh, they are not related in fact because uh, in clan wise we are and in our tables we are different but under the clan of me we are sub clan that is why we we could call brother and sister is that okay to you yes yes very much yes. very much very much yeah uh, so with this, we have come to the end of our session. But before we uh, before we fully end this interview, uh, I hope and I look forward that through this interview, our community, especially the present younger generation, they will get to know something about Haipo Jadunang, a great Naga freedom fighter. Because with the influence of this present era, the, the younger generations are so much carried away that we fail to acknowledge or we fail to know the importance, the historical facts about our own leaders. So yeah. I'm glad that the ZNSP took up this, this great initiative, this wonderful idea to uh, come up with this platform uh, as we observe the 90th that anniversary of Haipo Jadanang. It was a wonderful session indeed. Yeah, we, we had a wonderful session and 
congratulations to the ZNSP team as well for this yes, wonderful yes. idea. And once again, I'd like to thank you, sir, for making yourself available for this interview. Uh, thank you from my side. Thank you to you, Dada, for you know uh, for your questions. You know you have asked a very important questions. I think I might not be able to deliver that kind of uh, answer directly or indirectly because some of the questions is very pertinent to our society. But I hope that you know little bit of knowledge I shared might have you know pervades you or give you some enlightenment because we are in learning process zadunang ideology is not theorized at all uh, we may be called as a subaltern you know aspect you know where the dominant discourse is not accepting whatever we call it but we need to you know bring up this kind of you know uh, theory his political ide ideology and theorize it and then put into a bigger platform then we literally can bring up to the academic level in the you know in the international level and national level i think this is the initiative you know we we started uh, our footstep uh, i'm hopeful that you know this video whatsoever we had discussed will enlighten us and you know i, I also learned a lot from joining these sessions not that I know everything, but I learned because the moment when you ask questions, you know, I try to, you know, you know, questions myself and I try to, you know, introspect what kind of possibility that has, I suppose I don't have us. So I'm, it is a word and it is a great opportunity for me to uh, allow myself to uh, in front of uh, the ZNSP. Uh, and to all the viewers, thank you so much from my side.